Well, hello to you all. I hope this finds you in good shape and that you and your loved ones and teams are safe. My name is Greg Ingham and welcome to the first Bristol Life Business Surgery. We're trying to help businesses and employees in these tough times with practical advice and valuable insights. We can all do with help in these odd, even bewildering times. These Bristol Life Business Surgeries should help guide you on your vital decisions in the coming months. Decisions which are right now affecting your business, your em employees and our city's economy. It's not at all easy for any of us, with our business plans long since decimated, as we seek to find the best way forward and the fairest way forward for our teams. Good luck. One other prior to starting, uh, if you have time sensitive news such as your business opening up, please do talk to us about using the Bristol Life weekly newsletter out tomorrow and every Friday going to several thousand uh, Bristolians and we'll have a retail special issue next Wednesday. Our doors are open. Please look out for that. So today we'll be hearing from Bevan Britton on employment and HR. We'll cover everything from the furlough scheme and its changes, holiday entitlement, return to work, employers duty of care, employees rights, all in the context of lockdown right now and then return to work. The advice is for business owners, employees, senior managers, those with HR responsibility, pretty much all of us in any form of business or organisations. We have a wide range of companies watching us here today. And this webinar will be available afterwards on our Bristol Life YouTube channel. I'll be interviewing two speakers from Bevan Britton on your behalf, and we'll bring questions in during it. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a little Q&A button. We'll attempt to get through as many as we can. We've already had loads in advance uh, which have been sent to us. They can of course be uh, anonymous if it's at all uh, sensitive uh, and we'll cope with that. We'll also bring in a couple of people on screen as well. So let me introduce our two speakers today. Um, let's bring forward Julian. Uh, uh, Julian Hoskins, our partner, a partner at Bedford Britain, a qualified barrister and solicitor who has been advising employers in both private and public sectors on all aspects of contentious and non-contentious employment for over 25 years, a very experienced man. He's ranked as a top tier practitioner by the two legal directories, uh, Legal 500 and Chambers, and he leads the largest employment team in the Southwest. In other words, that, that's very high level, uh, significant advice, uh, which we'll be hearing uh, fairly shortly and free courtesy of this uh, business surgery from Bristol Life. We'll also, um, if I could bring forward uh, Rachel as well, um, we would also hear from Julian Newman, uh, Rachel Newman, an employment solicitor at Bevan Britain, uh, experienced in providing complex legal advice as well as day-to-day -day HR guidance and support to businesses of all sizes. And that HR advice is important throughout, but particularly uh, in the context of return to work. Julian, if we may, let's start with Bevan Britain uh, as a company. Uh, how has lockdown been for you as an organisation? Well, Greg, it's been, uh, I think it's difficult for us as, as, as everyone else. Uh, rather bizarrely, we had a dry run at it about two years ago because we had an oil leak, uh, which meant that we had to leave our building for, 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 for two weeks. And therefore, uh, due to that, we had systems in place for everyone working from home. So in terms of kit, screens and, uh, and everything else, that, that worked very smoothly, very quickly, and we got everybody uh, up, and, up and running at home. But then, of course, the other, the other side of it is sort of communication with the, with the employees going, going forward, uh, and particularly issues that, that they are facing. I guess, I mean, we could talk about this for ages, but the, the, the one big one, because um, we have a four o'clock uh, team meeting every day, I think is, is those with young children. Uh, I, I think it is particularly uh, difficult for them to to juggle that homeschooling and work and that, uh, there really is no easy solution to that um, but that becomes more wearing as, as lockdown continues. Yeah I and mean, that's, that's an issue for all businesses how you juggle uh, homeschooling um, and in fact I'll, I'll ask you one question on that which is a little bit off piece from this but I'll try this one. Um, we know that obviously government is seeking to open up schools for certain two year groups. Um, I saw a survey just now saying that two in five schools are not opening. What actual rights do individuals have, parents have, not you know, for their kids not to go to school in current times? Can you just say no? That, 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 that's not an area of my expertise. I know. But I think, I think if you have um, genuine uh, concerns over the health and safety of, of your children, 
um, uh, you know, as a result of COVID, I, I cannot see anybody, any educational authority taking any sort of proceedings against you um, for, for taking that decision. We'll, we'll come on to the same type of principle question uh, when we come on to, to employment. Uh, the rights of employees to say, uh, I don't believe the, the offices are COVID uh, safe or alternatively public transport is not something we should do. Uh, Julian, um, for now, I'm just going to bring in uh, Rachel and, and then I'll come back to you on the furlough scheme. Hello, Rachel. Um, Hi. How, how are you this morning? I'm um, well, thank you. Um, good. I'm getting more used to doing these from home now, which is good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, you have a very neutral backdrop, which is probably very wise. Um, how, how has lockdown been for you personally? Personally, it's, it's been okay. I don't have young children. I live alone. So in some respects, that's easier. But then also there's that real isolation point, the not having someone to turn to for a quick conversation. But I'm quite fortunate at Bev and Britain, we do have this four o'clock call every day, just the Sometimes it lasts two minutes, sometimes half an hour, sometimes it's about work, sometimes it's just a good chat. And there's always someone kind of you can reach out to. And it's just having that flexibility of the hours as well. So I do kind of do shopping for other people. And luckily I've got an employer that's very understanding of that and kind of we can work the hours as and when we can. So very, very remarkably good. well so far. To, to that point about uh, a, a partner that uh, you can turn to, um, you can argue it's either a problem uh, halved because uh, you're sharing it, or totally it's a problem doubled <laughs> because it can be quite intense. <laughs> Let's come on to the, the furlough scheme uh, with, with Julian, if I may. Um, Julian, can you pick up some principal do's and don'ts for employ employers uh, where you've been asked to uh, clarify certain points and perhaps specifically in the context of the key changes under JRS uh, 2.0? Yes, um, I, I think to start with, going, going back to March, uh, things were very unclear and guidance kept coming up uh, and changing. But most employers are pretty much on, on track now and, and, you know, and the guidance is clear. So what we're, we're really looking at now is the changes that have been announced uh, by the government uh, in the uh, FFS, as they are uh, rather ironically calling it, but the, the flexible furlough scheme. Um, do you know that um, that appellation of passed me by? It actually is the FFS. It is, yeah. <laughs> Magnificent. Um, so uh, the key changes, as, I, as I'm sure uh, everyone will be aware, is the the right to um, uh, to work part time after the first of July and remain on furlough, um, and that's being implemented in stages. So that from the 1st of July, uh, the, the government effectively will um, uh, pick up the, or rather the employer will pick up the, the, the tab for tax and national insurance. Uh, from the 1st of August, uh, they will, uh, in addition, pay 10% uh, of the employee's wages. And uh, the following month, the 1st of October, 20%. Um, but that is for the period of time that the employee is uh, truly furloughed. But they can, for example, work half the week um, and the employer will pay them in the usual way for that half the week. And then the employer will pay back uh, using the principles I've outlined for the other half, the other half of the week, the government will pay back the employer. Can we come to a, a practical point? Um, in reality, how will anyone know so if we say to, to perhaps one of our team or other businesses, uh, we would like you to come back one or two days a week, um, employees are, are often raring to go, they're sort of pent up where they are currently. Yes. Who, who would know if they were doing two, three, four days a week? Not that I'm at all uh, condoning or advising that, but it's the compliance point. Oh, it, it's a good question, Greg, but um, j just thinking about other things that have happened in the past outside of this, someone might squeal, someone might whistleblow within your own organisation. And that would, be, that would typically be someone who was disgruntled for another reason, maybe a year down the line because you're taking them through a disciplinary procedure or, or something like that. Um, they, they would squeal. Uh, to the revenue, and um, <laughs> and then they would come down on uh, you know like a ton of bricks. I think the second point to make is that um, further clarification of of, of the uh, FFS is going to come from the government on uh, the twelfth of July. Um, so there may be more detail about monitoring 
um, and, and, and what you are going to be obliged to do in terms of making returns. Are, are, there, are there any risks of um, inadvertent non-compliance? If there's going to be clarification come mid-July and some businesses listening to this will be uh, part-time bringing their, their people back prior to then, isn't there, a, isn't there a potential... Uh, I beg your pardon, actually, so 12th of June, 12th of June. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. That was my mistake. Right, okay, that, 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 the point folds in which case. Um, okay, uh, so you were saying from, from 12th of June, uh, whenever the clarifi clarification comes, it will have some element of monitoring, reporting, administering. Is, is, is that what you're yes. anticipating? Yes. Right. Um, one, one hopes, uh, on behalf of all businesses out there, that it's not onerous. <laughs> Because yeah. that's, that's the last thing you want when you've got heads full of uh, how, how are you going to get through the next few months is to have the uh, uh, highly detailed reports you have to do. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, from Blackstar Solutions, El Elliot Mace, um, who will bring on screen uh, to ask a question in this area. Uh, he, like many, is interested in the, the part-time element. Uh, so uh, is, Elliot, uh, is Elliot with us? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? We can indeed. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, good, thank you. Um, I'm three months since my last haircut, um, and uh, you look to be a similar amount of time there, Greg, but uh, looking, dapper as, looking dapper as always. Uh, and Julie, nice to see you again. I've met you before at one of the Bristol Life Lunches, yes. uh, yeah. and Rachel, I've, I've not met you before, so hi. Um, yeah, I think you sadly have sort of pretty much 90% answered my question anyway, and um, I'm sales director at Blackstar, and we, we don't have many people furloughed, but we, we do have a few, and particularly in, in sales, as you can imagine. Um, and they are now starting to ask me uh, more and more vociferously when they can come back to work. And, and obviously, I need to try and develop a pipeline for them. Um, so it's a little bit chicken and egg in that there's no work, but I need them to come back to work in order to create some work for themselves. So it is particularly for those guys and, and other, other disciplines as well, that part time thing um, and some clarification really around um, how much flexibility there will be. Um, I'm at the moment with Furlo, obviously, you, I think you have. Uh, three weeks um, minimum and then you can come back and, and go back again and all that kind of good stuff which is quite onerous um, so I've yeah, I've got a few people who are chomping at the bit to to start doing even a day a week um, and then gradually upgrading that to two or three and, and in a sales capacity obviously as they create more work for themselves they can they can start to come back so I think Julian you, you've pretty much answered my question um, but if there's anything more you could expand on for, for that and whether it changes by discipline or, or by industry or anything like that that would be really useful as well thank you yeah yeah it's not going to change by industry as I understand it I the first point the first point is you can bring someone back for any amount of time part-time so it could be one day it could be two days it could be half a day I understand it or it could be four days so there will be complete flexibility uh, we'll know more on June the 12th but I understand that the the um, the notice period or, or, or the claim period under the scheme in relation to part-time is somehow going to be amended from the the three weeks to, to one week in terms of part-time work now I don't know we haven't had any details uh, about that yet but we're expecting to get that on the 12th of June. Do, I think Julian, could, could, can I clarify that point because um, I, I, I personally may have misunderstood it. Currently um, we have to give three weeks notice of anyone coming back, uh, sorry being furloughed again, is that right? And then well, yeah, the, the claim pit, it, it's worked in three week claim periods right. so an, a, a, an employer claims for three weeks and the minimum amount of time someone um, can go on furlough for is, is for three weeks and you can then rotate the workforce but there's going to be some kind of change to that um, which will be clarified on the 12th of June in terms of the flexible scheme but there's one further point this is this is a very very important point that hasn't hasn't come out um, in terms Elliot, of, of your strategy really in, in having to look now um, to the end of October to decide what you want to do. And that is because from the 30th of June, the furlough scheme is going to be closed to new entrants. So that means if you haven't put a specified individual on furlough before the 30th of June, you will not be able to furlough that individual, either flexibility or otherwise, after the 30th of June. And um, a subsidiary point to that, equally important, is um, this is all about the number of employees you claim for from the government. So at the moment, say for example, 
you've got 20 employees and you've been rotating them. So you've had 10 employees on furlough at any one time. The maximum number of employees you're going to be able to have on furlough flexibly, flexibly or otherwise from July the 1st is 10 employees. And the final difficult point about that is that that means you need to decide by the 10th of June, which it won't escape to everyone's attention is before the proper government guidance comes out on the 12th of June, you're gonna to have to decide by the 10th of June who you want furloughed and how many you want furloughed until the end of October, because there has to be that three week period from the 10th of June to the end of June before flexible starts. So they, I mean, if anything to take away from this about the flexible scheme, uh, it's really those points. You need to be thinking over the next few days sure. exactly what you need going to the end of October in terms of the furlough scheme. Absolutely, well that's very useful, thank you. And I can see why they've called it FFS. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very good, um, we'll try not to uh, dwell on that point too long, but thank you, thank you. <laughs> Um, I, I would like to, to revert to Julian uh, on that last point. Can you just clarify again for um, the basis of uh, people such as me, but to everyone else on, on the call, when you said if you have 10 and you furlough, if you have 20 employees and you, you can furlough 10 and that will be the maximum going forward, is that a ratio point? In other words, you could have half of your staff. Um, what if you have uh, currently, I don't know, 100 employees and uh, 90 of them are on furlough and you're not expecting to bring them back until uh, September. How, how might that work? Well, if you have 90, if, if um, at the 30, 30th of June, at any stage between March and the 30th of June, you have had 90 people on furlough in any one of those three week periods, you can have 90 people on furlough in any period after that. The, the trap here, I think for the unwary, is really where you've been rotating employees. So you've had 45 and 45, you can't then have 90 doing part-time work, which is I think what people are going to be thinking if you, you know, in terms of capacity. Um, it's, it, it's all about the numbers that you've claimed for in any reference period. Right. So, so if I may, to put it the other way round, yeah. um, whatever your maximum has been by June uh, 10, as you're suggesting is the, the cutoff point, whatever your maximum has been, that would be your maximum going forwards. Yes. And uh, the other way to put it in terms of strategy and, and business planning is you have to sit down now over the next couple of days and say, look, we're going to need 50 people on furlough, or, albeit they'll be working part time. Uh, after 1st of July, so we're going to have to furlough 50 people, although we might not want to, on the 10th of June, so that that three week period up to the up to the end of June is complied with. Right, we've just had a, a, a question and it is actually from uh, um, someone on our team, uh, Sarah Rawlins, our finance manager, she yeah. says, uh, and we, we've touched on this, but just to clarify the point, if a staff member has already been furloughed during April and May, but is not furloughed in June, are they able to be furloughed, for example, in August? Or do they have to be furloughed during the 10th of June until the 30th of June? Now, you know, that's a very, very good question. The reason why is the guidance that has come out is a bit ambiguous on that. But, oh, uh, but, but I am absolutely confident. Uh, so, you know, the advice is that, yes, you can furlough them. So they don't have to be furloughed, any named individual, between the 10th of June and, and the end of June, but they must have been furloughed some stage between March and the end of June. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a, a question for our, our very good friend Anonymous, um, who pops up several times. Um, uh, this is a person running a, a retail place. And again, it's, it's, it's in this territory. Um, the main question is about how and when they should bring back their four employees out of furlough, given that it's, it's truly for them and for many, uh, including us, it's impossible to know what level of work there will be, um, in their case, when they reopen on June 15. If incoming work is at a much reduced level initially, would you recommend only bringing back one employee in June and then starting slowly to phase the others in, uh, maybe for two days, etc.? Is, is that a sort of a phased approach? And how might that work with the strictures about uh, the maxima by at the end of June? Well, I think one particular um, <clears throat> issue with the retail industry, which I don't think the government has, has spoken about, is because, of course, this flexible furlough won't be... Um, won't be operating until the 1st of July. So you've got that difficult two week period. Mm. Um, 
So I, I'm not sure if this is, I think this is answering the question, but if, if for example, you think that you are, are going to need um, people up and running in July, uh, on the 15th of June, you, you're really best not to furlough them and try and agree with them some kind of um, variation to the contract for, for part-time work, for a lesser salary, uh, for that two weeks. Uh, but again, it's the same principle applies. Is it, 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 as long as people are on furlough now, at some stage in the future, uh, or have been on furlough, you, you can, you can re-furlough them. Okay, um, a follow-up question from, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from Nathan Baranowski of uh, Ojo. Um, he's asking, how will this new system be flexible if we don't need to furlough now, but we see August and September being a challenge and need to furlough some staff in this period, you're saying that under the guidance, we could not access the scheme. Can you point us to any useful guidance on this from what you have just shared? Well, I mean, in terms of um, whether you can access the scheme if you haven't furloughed people, that's, that's, that is going to be, that will be confirmed, but that's, that's how it is. So, you know, in your situation, you're, you're just going to have to look at other measures and you're not going to be able to, to, to rely upon the scheme. So that's going to be uh, short time working, uh, laying people off, um, uh, seeking agreement to amend uh, terms and conditions, or even trying to you know, impose those, which is a whole other topic, which we won't sort of have time to go into, but uh, you're not going to be able to access the scheme in those circumstances. But put, put another way around, is it, um, I mean, this can't be definitive because it won't apply in all cases, but is it generally the point, if in doubt about furloughing, do furlough now because you won't be able to later? Absolutely right. It's for this next three week period, that will give you maximum flexibility further down the line. So, so I think that's, that's amongst the points you've said, that's one of the key takeaways. Uh, it's reassess what your current level of furlough is and if you think you might need to furlough during the summer months uh, whilst we're all assessing how business is. Can I come on to a, a, a different point which applies to those who are, uh, they, they are furloughed now, they may well be later. It's the definition of what work is. I'll give you sort of, um, this is perhaps minutiae, but I'll give you an example and tell me at what point does this cross the barrier into work? Say someone who's, um, who's furloughed, um, they repost something on social media, even about this, uh, this very event today, they repost on social media. Does that constitute work? If they were to post something, initiate something about this you know, amazing opportunity, whatever it might be in whichever area, is yeah. that work? Um, I'd be really keen to talk to you about blah, blah, blah. Is that work? If you refer a lead to a colleague, you know, what is the definition of work at the margin? Because I think many employees uh, and employers uh, 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 struggling with that fine point. We don't wish to put ourselves offside. No, and I, I think ultimately the the, uh, the government will take a sensible, pragmatic approach in terms of not trying to um, say that you've breached the scheme. Um, but I think as an employer, I think the key thing is you need to do uh, your absolute best to make it clear to employees that they can't work. So, for example, if you've got an email, um, you need an out of office on that email. That having been said, if someone contacts you, a client of the firm, and they need advice, they get you out of office. But I don't think there would be anything wrong in redirecting them to another person. Mm. I don't think that would constitute work. I think that's the right side of the line. In terms of the social media stuff you're, you're talking about, um, you know, I think that depends what your job is, frankly. Uh, I think in, in your organisation, if, if employees started sort of uh, retweeting um, stuff, I think that, that would be work, um, frankly. So I, I think generally uh, retweeting, reposting things to do with work, which ultimately is uh, with the aim to generating revenue uh, for the company, I mean, that, 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 that's the ultimate aim. I think it falls the wrong side of the line. So I think my advice is to, is, is, is to, is to make that clear. Uh, the government knows that the company's still got to operate. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the scheme is to keep, keep businesses in business. Um, so I think it, 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 it's, it's a common sense approach. Um, but from an employer's point of view, it, it, it's give the direction. If the employee then goes a bit off piece, well, I, you know, I don't think you're gonna get any comeback on that. Is there, um... Have you experienced anything akin to the equivalent of uh, driving to Durham or doing a 60-mile uh, uh, tour to check your eyesight? In other words, that 
under these terms, there has been a lessening of compliance and people, you know, into a gray area of not quite working, but pushing the line more than they would have done back in March. This is in terms of employees working while on, while on furlough. Yeah, and, and yeah. the definition of what that constitutes, and indeed employers uh, prompting employees. Yeah, I, I, actually, I haven't come across that uh, myself. I don't know if, if, if Rachel has with any clients. I think if anything, for some of the clients that I've advised, it's perhaps more gone the other way. People have got used to being on furlough and are actually getting used to not working. I think at the very start, you've got these employees that they want to work, they want to help, so they were posting things, trying to reach out to team members. But I think now, especially if someone's been on furlough for a long period of time, they're getting more used to kind of being that slightly more removed. And I think for employers, it's making sure that if we are concerned that our employees who are on furlough are becoming a bit more lax, maybe because they're bored or they're disengaged and they want to be more engaged, we just need to reiterate that message. So again, if it was ever looked at by HMRC, we said, well, as an employer, we've done what we can. It's, it's very clear in the initial furlough agreement and we've re-sent that message to make sure our employees are aware that we're not, they're not to work whilst on furlough. And like I said, it's not going to be a real way to, to police people fully, but as an employer, it's showing that we've done what we can. Thank you. And let's, let's move on to uh, uh, advice on the sort of notice period of, of bringing people back from furloughing. And this is maybe perhaps more for you, Rachel. Um, how much is sensible advice? So it's not, uh, you know, you're back to work tomorrow, uh, but equally it's not, we're going to give you six months notice or some such. What do you think is, is appropriate generally? I think it will somewhat differ between how long someone's been on furlough and the industry. So I think there are going to be some specifics to kind of the individual employer. I know some employers that have given two days notice and they're quite small and they feel that's sufficient. To me, I feel a week is perhaps a bit more comfortable because we really need to make sure that our employees are comfortable coming back. They're engaged. They're aware of what we've done to make the workplace safe if they're physically coming back. And giving them that week's notice gives them time to, if they've got concerns or questions, there's time for them to raise them with the employer and the employer to respond to try and make that process smoother. I think a shorter time will end up becoming problematic because people are going to raise questions. Can we answer them in those two days? If not, are people coming back? Should they be back? Are they still on furlough? So I think building in enough time and having the resource available at the business ready to answer those questions and give that good communication is, is perhaps the key there. And what, what advice would you give? And, and again, of course, to your point, uh, all businesses are, are, are different and their needs are different. But what advice would you give about helping employees become match fit, as it were? If you take the comparison with uh, professional sports people, there is a training period, there are friendlies or whatever, and eventually the season starts and then they get match fit during that process. We, can't, we haven't got that time scale and we've not got that familiarity of process. What do you advise? Well, I think it all comes down to that level of communication. So when we're first letting people know and giving them that notice, we need to make sure we've already got kind of our ducks in a row by that point. So we know that the workplace is safe to return to. So we've looked at things such as having wipes, having desks noted as non-workable or workable to make sure they're separated, perhaps one-way systems. And we've got all of that documented, not just in writing, but perhaps someone having done a short um, video tour of the office as it will then be, or pictures of the steps that have taken, just so we can share those with the employees in advance to try and ease any concerns about what they're walking back into. Because I mean, I've gone into the office and there's this one way system. I knew that was going to be in place. If I hadn't have done, it would have been slightly first day back, perhaps after you know three, four, five, six weeks that would have been slightly unsettling. So I think it's trying to view it from the case of someone's been off three months, what do we need to let them know has been resolved to kind of put those, those kind of concerns to rest? Good, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll re return to um, some practical points. I think we've got a, a couple of questions on those, but I, I'm also thinking about the, um, uh, the psychological uh, element. If you have been in, in whatever form furloughed, whatever your domestic setup is and so on, um, your head isn't into it uh, or, or whatever. How, how, do we, how do we prep our teams to be able to be active? Because all of us in business need our teams to be active that split second back when our costs start to turn back on again. I think, again, this sounds a bit repetitive, but it's that communication and making sure the managers on site 
a prep so everyone knows who they can go to speak to if they need a conversation. It's not about the work that they've got in their inbox, but it's about how they feel going to work. If there's employee assistance programs, putting that within the letter, giving notice of coming back to work and saying, you know, I think someone's acknowledging that someone might feel anxious about the situation is the first step. So putting contact details where they can get that type of help in the communications, reaching out to them, perhaps once they have returned, being more lenient about what you expect from them. So if you'd normally have kind of targets in place, appreciate that not only has this person not worked in a month, but they're now working in an entirely different situation with perhaps screens up next to them, sanitizer next to them. It, it's the first couple of days. I think really we just need to appreciate that people are just getting used to being there and not expecting kind of the levels of productivity that you would have before and making sure that the employees are reassured that that is the case so they're not coming in sitting at the desk panicking that they're not being very productive um, and having perhaps a set person that someone can go to perhaps a forum if there's groups perhaps suggesting um, arranging a, a, a meeting or a zoom call between them so that they can kind of speak to each other before coming back um, obviously we need to be careful if someone's on furlough that they're not working but just making sure that people know who they can reach out to and that managers just perhaps aren't expecting as much from people initially. Can, can I just take that, uh, pretty much the latter point you said about make sure they're not working. You imagine in a team, four, five, ten people, whatever, they're saying, okay, uh, we're trying to work out what we might be doing come August, September, October. Does that, it's, not a, it's somewhere between a brainstorm and a planning session, does that constitute work? I, I would be uncomfortable I think with someone going to that level of detail whilst on furlough because by doing that planning what they're doing is planning on how best to create and generate revenue for the business so that they're planning on how to bring people back to generate that revenue so I, I would be slightly nervous about that if it needs to be done before the first of July then it may be a case of unfurlowing some kind of key players to do that or if it's after the 1st of July, then making use of that flexible furlough scheme and perhaps bringing people off furlough for minimal times to have those types of meetings and discussions. Yeah, I mean, we're, we all need to be careful of not being too scared of our own shadows, I guess. And um, everyone is, is, of course, thinking about their individual uh, work, their, their role, and of course, from the company's point of view, about what the new world might look like for those businesses which are not back yet. Um, one way or another, there is a there is a grey area between thinking about it, thinking we might do things a bit differently, and planning, and then setting a scheme and having the detail. Um, we're all on that course. So, uh, and for, for those uh, for those watching, of course, uh, it, it is inevitable and right that professional advisors will, on the whole, err on the side of caution. We all have to take our judgment about what is appropriate uh, for that type of activity. So, so thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'd like. If I can just say the audit trail is really important. So if you feel that actually you need to speak to an employee who's on furlough, it's not you, you don't consider it work and it's just the correct the conversation you need to have. Have a call note for that file and your rationale behind it. And that isn't the type of people that HMRC are going to try and, and look after. They want to go, you know, the people that are trying to be fraudulent, not those that are trying to make the business work and to retain their employees. Thank you. I'd like to, to revert to sort of a slightly earlier stage in this, um, uh, this may be uh, slightly more Julian's territory, which is holidays during furlough. Uh, we'd just like as much as we can to have clarity on what can and can't happen, both from, really from an employer's point of view, uh, now and under the new scheme as well. What, what options uh, do employers have to say, for example, uh, we are effectively insisting you take a holiday during this period? or that they limit the holiday subsequently when people return? Well, so far as the new scheme is concerned, it's not going to make any difference um, to, to, to the position. Um, I think the first, first point is pay. What is now clear is that if an employee uh, takes holiday whilst on furlough, um, they need to be paid at 100% by the employer uh, rather than the 80%. So essentially, uh, the employer will be paying 20% towards the employee's uh, salary for those days. Um, can uh, a, a, an employer, 
force, if you like, an employee on furlough or indeed any other employee in these circumstances to take holiday because in many ways nobody wants to take holiday at the moment because we can't, we can't go anywhere. Um, and, you know, and, and the answer is, um, and there's a slight caveat, it's going to depend on what you've got in your own policies, but broadly speaking, the answer is an employee, an employer can do what's reasonable to insist um, that a proportion of holiday is taken by a particular time. And to give you a for instance, which is very common at the moment, we are insisting, uh, we have a calendar year holiday year, and we're insisting our employees take 75% of their leave by the end of September. The key thing is that we've already given them that notice mm -hmm. um, and and ultimately that would be very difficult um, uh, for for an em employee uh, to challenge. And part of the rationale for that from a business point of view, uh, which is where the, the law comes from, is that it's all about relaxation. Holidays are an employee's right to relax whether we're on lockdown or not and they shouldn't just be working through to September. So, so that can be done, yes. What about, um, I, I heard of one company that's saying it's so business critical from September to Christmas when, when their business returns, um, they are not allowing any of their team to take holiday during that period. Is that legal? Um, that, is, that is legal, um, or, or it could be legal, and that, that's been envisaged uh, by the government who amended the working time regulations to say that uh, where it isn't reasonably practicable, and those, those are the important words, for an employee to take holiday in this calendar year, they have a statutory right to carry it over for two years, the next two years. So they're not gonna lose their holiday. Um, I guess what, what, what so I, I understand that. Of course, the, the other way to approach that is, is to make sure they take as much holiday as possible before September. Uh, so, so that they are there during that during that three week period. And, and, and a related point: something may be legal, but it may still not be advisable um, because of you know it is about uh, uh, momentum within a business and buy in from employees. So it needs to be communicated and, and shared and, yeah. and, and agreed prior. Yes, um, even if it is effectively a fait accompli. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I've got this other point to this. So that point about carrying over for, for two years that's that's a statutory right. What if, for example, an, an individual employer has more, which many do, more than the statutory number of holidays for their employees? What happens in that case? Does all of the, um, the contractual rights carry over into subsequent years or only the, um, the statutory rights? It's only the statutory leave, the European statutory leave, but that's 5.6 weeks. So that's quite a lot of holiday. Albeit that includes the, the bank holidays. It does, yeah. Yeah. And um, who knows, there may be another bank holiday in, in, in October that's been talked about uh, yes. from a, a tourist point of view and so on. Yes. Um, and how about an employee, this is another uh, one of our anonymous friends, uh, can an employee legitimately argue there simply was not the option for holidays during furlough and that a quote, restorative break can't be had if you can't leave home for a period? Well, the employees are arguing that. I think you look at that in two stages. There would be some, some scope for that in complete lockdown. Um, there would be much less scope for that now. But I think what most commentators are saying is um, that those claims are, are probably unlikely to be successful um, go, going forwards. So how this will pan out is, is that you'll get to the end of the year, somebody hasn't taken their holiday. And this is getting back to the reasonably practicable. The employee will say, I want to take it over for two years because it wasn't reasonably practicable to take it. The employer will say, well, actually, yes, it was. You could, you could have taken your holiday. And I think, um, providing there's been proper communication, employer will win that particular um, argument. But of course, until it's litigated, we don't know. And, and as a general sphere, I'm sure, is the, the pragmatic approach, which, which many businesses have already taken for a long time, which is, of course, you do what is legal, but ultimately you do what is fair and reasonable yeah, as well. And, and that is the, the guidance point. Thank you. Let's move on to um, the current state for many, many of us right now, of course, um, which is working from home. Um, I, I think it's maybe slightly more Rachel's territory. Um, I'd just like to, point to, to get into the territory of the trust points between employer and employee about how much an employer might expect their team to report back, prove that they're working, et cetera. Um, can you just talk to that point? Yes, I think, 
some of it will depend on the type of work you do. So whether the output is easily measurable or whether it is going to be receiving a call from your manager and, and questioning you on that. And I think that's where we have to be very careful that, okay, we need to make sure if we're paying employees, they're working, but let's also not damage that employer employee relationship long term by making them feel kind of, you know, the big brother. So we're watching, we're monitoring and, you know, potentially not believing what you're doing. And I think by having regular perhaps calls, meetings, catch ups, there's ways of discussing what someone is doing without Without making it seem as though, right, can you account what you were doing between nine and ten yesterday, what you were doing between two and four? And, and that's where it's going to become difficult. I think if we try and have that really open forum of discussions, times to catch up, then kind of looking at it from that basis. If we think that someone is genuinely, you know, sat at home watching Netflix when they should be on their computer, then, then of course we should still feel comfortable to raise that and discuss it. But I think we need to make sure that first of all, if there's anything we can do prior to that, to check that they're okay. If we think someone's productivity is, is dipping, well, is that because there's a problem at home? Has childcare become more difficult? Are there mental health implications? Or is it that they just don't want to work? And trying to make sure we, we have those open conversations rather than you know jump to the conclusion of, well, last week they managed to do X amount, this, this week it's this amount it's sunnier, it must be because they don't want to work. So I, I think it is definitely difficult for employers and it, it's trying to have that open forum to discuss how people are and what they're doing to see if that eases any concerns. Well, I suppose it's that, that old adage uh, when it comes to sunshine and productivity and so on, that, uh, that correlation doesn't imply causation. Uh, it may be nothing to do with that at all. It may simply be that it's really hard out there to generate um, business in, in current times for, for, for many sectors, as we know. Um, I want to talk about the, um, is the duty of care for an employer any different if their employee is working from home than it is if it is in a workplace, an office, a shop or whatever? Mm. I think th th there's always that duty of care. And I think, I don't think the duty of care necessarily changes but I think the way we go about protecting that duty and making sure we're fulfilling that duty so you know for example if we we're in the office Julian would see my face whether he wants to or not probably most days and be able to kind of judge how I am as to you know whether I'm just sat at the computer head down whether I'm turning around and talking and so you can have a look at some of those kind of you know those types of duties easily and what we just need to focus on okay I can't see my employees they're at home not assuming they're okay, whilst also not badgering them on a daily basis, are you still okay, are you still okay? It, it's trying to find that middle ground. And there's kind of the people aspect, but then also the kind of the technology aspect. So are we sure that the equipment they're using at home isn't causing them any harm? Are they happy, are they comfortable? Is there anything that they've asked for that we can provide that would make that working from home um, a more comfortable and workable experience for them? And are they experienced in working from home? So I, I worked from home before this, perhaps one, two days a week. So I kind of had an idea how that would work. Other people had never worked from home and it's understanding the different levels of support people may need. Well, let's, let's come on to the, the push and the pull on that point, um, both now, but really in, in the future. It's, it's probable that most businesses will have slightly more flexibility in terms of the amount of working from home time there might be it's quite possible that certain businesses will say, we're not ready to open the office yet, so you have to work from home. What rights do an employee have, have in either situation? On the one hand, um, they don't have the, the setup at home domestically, whatever it is, kit, Wi-Fi, uh, people in the house, the flat, or whatever, and they want to go to work. Can an employer say, well, well, no, you have to work from home? Then the other way around, can an employee say, I am fearful of returning to work. Uh, for, it may not be COVID safe in their view. They may not wish to travel on public transport and say, no, I will do the work, but I, I will do it from home. How does the right sit between both employer and employee? It is difficult. I'd say if we take the second one, first of all, where we want the employees back and they've got a genuine concern or fear, there is legislation to protect them. So we need to be very careful if someone has got those, those genuine concerns for their welfare, especially if they do have to go on public transport. If we're able to keep them working at home, then that's what we can do, but making sure we're keeping in contact with them. 
if we feel their concerns are relating to the actual workplace, so they don't feel that they're going to be safe coming into work, that goes back to the communication point. So let's see what we can do to work with them to get them to be confident to come in. So staggered start times, staggered leave times, um, different lunch times to make sure there's less kind of traffic through doorways at set times. So I think we can, can work with them. What I would say if there's their outright, no, I, I think I'm at risk coming in, I don't want to, I would, <laughs> to be quite lawyery, say take some specific advice because I think there is a risk there. They do have rights under health and safety legislation potential whistleblowing. So if they're saying, well, actually, I've, I've raised a, a genuine concern here. If we were to take action against them because they weren't willing to come in and potential detriment claims, I think it will become clearer over the next few weeks. And it might be the case, that, again, that the government gives some more guidance about how they want employers to pro approach this. Um, but I would say it's going to be looking at kind of more of that case by case um, basis and flipping it. If someone wants to come in and we're saying the office isn't ready, some of it's going to be looking at their contracts. Their place of work is probably the office. But what if we agreed with them? Have they implied they agreed now that they, they work from home because they've been doing that? And maybe by explaining to them why they can't come into the office. Actually, it's because we don't consider we can make it safe for you. And therefore, under our you know, health and safety obligations, it, we can't have you back in. And that is to protect you. But why is it that you want to come back in? Is there anything we can do to help with that? So making sure rather it's an answering a question, it's opening that conversation. Okay, thank you. We've got about 15 minutes left. I'll, I'll shortly be bringing in uh, Neil Snow uh, from, from Media Clash. Uh, so if he can be uh, ready as it were. Um, and if we can move to slightly uh, quicker questions and shorter answers, I'll try to be brief. We've had one from an anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, do employees who have childcare responsibilities due to different school hours, schools, whatever being shut, uh, have the right to continue to work from home and not to return to the office as long as that particular occurrence continues? Is it a straight yes, no? Um, I don't think it's a straight yes, no, but I can keep it very brief. What we need to be careful about is that we're not imposing a rule on everyone that will indirectly impact, say, mothers with childcare responsibilities, indirect sex discrimination. So again, it's whether there's any flexibility suggesting certain days in, certain days at home, working different hours. Um, so I'd, I guess, again, that's why you give that week's notice. You can try and iron out those concerns and see if there's any compromise. Good. And thank you. Let's, let's bring in Neil uh, talking about the 14-day the isolation period. Um, both, well, uh, you pop in, we can hear your, your thoughts. Hello. Can you, Hello. can you hear me? Can you see me? We can. You can probably see my screen growing, Greg. <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> my lockdown beard. No. Um, yeah, my question really, I was thinking about getting back to work and then I started thinking about colleagues and co-workers and, and the teams that will be around me. Um, and I was thinking, well, there's all this news about test and trace and how if people show any symptoms, it's always been the case that they have to self-isolate and do that for 14 days. Is, is there going to be guidance to employees and employers about how that would be paid um, and how it would be administered. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking, you know, if, if there's, there's going to be a lot more fear around symptoms of, of COVID, yeah. and if we're contacted on the Test and Trace app and told to stay at home, can we work or do we, do we have to not work and be taking sickness? Um, and if it's two yeah. weeks that you're at home for, you know, <laughs> so lots of employers will have a limit to how much sickness they, they pay and then it will start going to statutory sick. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, so if, uh, if Rachel, you could take that point, a very live point, given what happened in the House of Commons just yesterday. Yep. So the um, SSP regulations were amended to confirm that if you've been told to self-isolate via that test and trace system, that you're entitled to SSP for those two weeks. As to whether a company needs to pay over and above that, most company sick pay policies will confirm that's payable when the employee is sick. And then if they're not suffering symptoms, they're just isolating, then they wouldn't necessarily be entitled to company sick pay. I don't think it stops them working. So if they're saying, I've got this text, I have to self-isolate, but they can work from home, then they should work from home. What businesses may have to weigh up is if they... If the employee cannot work from home, so they're at home, they're entitled to SSP, 
and we as a business decide we're not going to pay any extra, we're going to leave it at the SSP, is there a risk that employees won't be honest and say they've had that text because they don't want to be at home on SSP? So I think it's going to be weighing up the pros and cons and then looking at how the cost that could have to the business and the risks there. Um, and I think that'll be mainly for people that are unable to work from home. If someone can work from home and they are well enough to work, they should work. Okay, um, thank you. We're going to bring in uh, David uh, Dulu uh, shortly from Dragonfly Creative. We're going to move on to some of the, frankly, more uh, grimmer territories, which is change of terms and particularly redundancies. I'm sure all questions are being asked in principle rather than directly about uh, someone's business. Uh, so David, if, uh, if you could come to screen, uh, you want to talk about those issues potentially around re redundancy process and uh, jury under furlough. Or if not, Hi, yeah, 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 good. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can indeed, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, morning everyone uh, the, so my question was on the challenges around reintroducing furloughed staff um, and I suppose specifically um, some of the companies that that I work with there's a there's some concern perhaps around the considerations or implications if people would need to make uh, redundancies having furloughed people um, uh, and what are the what are the concerns there um, and what, what what should businesses consider Thank you. And so could you uh, also perhaps, uh, perhaps Julian or, or Rachel, just pick up what is different now, if at all, than previously? And how does, how does the furlough relationship change or not the redundancy process? Um, well, short answer is it, it, it doesn't really change the process. But again, getting back to the planning point that I've, I've, I've talked about before, uh, I'm speaking to businesses at the moment who, who know that that is going to be the outcome uh, at the end of the furlough scheme. And um, essentially, you're going to have to consult with employees and there are time periods, which I, which, which I won't go into now. So you, you need to be planning, planning well ahead. The other key point is, is that uh, when you make an employee redundant, you have to pay them notice or uh, they work their notice or you pay them in lieu of notice. If you make them redundant, which you absolutely can do, um, while they're on furlough, so before before it all ends um, in October, essentially the government will will pick up eighty percent of the of the notice uh, pay, and notice periods tend to vary from sort of one month to three months typically, so that's that's not an inconsiderable sum. And the final thing I get I get asked um, in terms of what's different is getting back to the consultation is that is that working. Um, can you engage with employees in, in that way during furlough? And by implication from what the government has said about other things, the answer is that won't be working uh, for the purposes of disentitling you uh, to get the grant. So you can carry out redundancy consultation processes during furlough. So, so uh, Julian, there's something of a paradox in there that the whole JRS is, is about protecting jobs and so on. And yet, if the government uh, is is by what you've said, would be picking up 80% of notice period if someone is under furlough. That's yeah. almost, it makes it, frankly, easier for businesses to make people redundant. Is, is that fair? Um, you, you could look at it that way. Um, the, I, I think the reality is um, the taxpayer will be, will, will be picking up part, part of the bill, um, but those employees come October, I think would have been made, made redundant anyway, um, you know, if you've reached that stage. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. And, and David, thank you for, for your question as well. Um, I do want to come on to a related point about if people wish, if companies wish to change employment terms, hours, salary particularly, um, temporarily, what happens if an employee simply doesn't accept that? Well, <clears throat> First stage is you try and get agreement, um, and um, implicit in not getting agreement is that the, the alternative may be redundancy. In fact, might be explicit, and that tends to help uh, focus minds and reach agreement. But presuming you can't get agreement, the only thing you can really do is follow a procedure to consult with the employee, and then dismiss them, and immediately re-engage them on the new terms for lesser hours and lesser pay. Um, 
And um, if you have followed a fair procedure and ultimately can persuade a tribunal you had a good business reason to do so, which in these circumstances shouldn't be too difficult, um, you would be able to do that. Uh, from an industrial relations point of view, you want to sort of start off on that procedure and then uh, hopefully reach agreement. And my experience is that that is what normally happens. And particularly if you're talking about a number of employees, it's a little bit like a pack of cards. Um, it, it, you know, is it when two or three say, actually, we will do this, uh, the, the, the others tend to follow. The only final point very quickly there, if you are, if this is in, in relation to 20 or more employees, you need to collectively consult. If you recognize a union, that will be with the union. And there are relatively lengthy days, at least 45 days to go through that process. Um, and if you don't do it, uh, you will have to pay what's called a protective award, which is three months gross pay per employee over and above any other claims. So you have to get that right. That's a short point. Uh, as ever, it is uh, uh, be careful and uh, tread forwards only with knowledge, I suspect, yes. or at least inside. And I'll pick up on, on that uh, as we, as we can begin to close this. Um, well, I've got a very specific question uh, from an attendee, um, and then I'll, I'll ask a more general point about information sources. Which source of information should businesses be looking to when hiring freelancers in relation to COVID-19 health and safety guidance, hiring, i.e., for example, hiring a freelance filmmaker to go out and film for a day as a third party? What advice would you give and where, where could that type of specific advice be, be best gleaned? So, so could you just bring that in relation to health and safety? Yeah, well, it's, it's about the, the broader issues around uh, COVID-19. If, if you have hired an employ, uh, a freelancer, to yeah. do work for you, physical work of whatever sort, out in the, in the community. Um, what are the obligations, uh, liabilities? How do you know that uh, you're operating fairly in that context? I mean, at the, the, at the end of the day, you just need to comply, um, in my view, with, you know, with the health and safety health and safety legislation. So in terms of protecting your other employees, which is maybe where this is partly, partly coming from, bringing that person uh, into the workplace, you will need to have done um, some kind of risk assessment. Um, you will need to have consulted with the individual to find out as much as you can. And then you need to sort of continually um, monitor um, you know, how they are working going forward. And, and, and just actually to say about that, that, that's the case in terms of return to work generally for all employees. It's, it's the three takeaway points is there needs to be some kind of risk assessment. You need to consult with them, but then you can't leave it at that. You need, you, you need to monitor it. So we're looking at two meter distancing. You, you, you need to make sure it's happened by I don't know, taking, taking a picture as things, things go along. So, so in, in other words, um, for the purposes of this, Freelancers are, are, are completely the same as full-time employees yeah. in terms of your duty of care as an employer. It, absolutely, and 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 definitely, if they bring COVID into the workplace and your one of your employees picks it up, yes. Yeah. And if I could ask uh, you both, and this uh, we are uh, about to close th this point. Um, other than the uh, the very good offices of uh, of Bev and Britain, um, where else might we as employers and employees find good source of practical information? specifically around the, uh, the COVID safe office planning, but more generally around this issue? Because these are, these are thorny issues and all of us are trying to navigate through complex areas. Where, where would you go to for sensible uh, advice beyond, of course, yourselves? So the Health and Safety Executive website has um, a telephone number for advice um, and also some helpful information on their website. So for health and safety points, I'd perhaps start there. It does come somewhat circular. They directly back to the government website at times, which then directly back to the health and safety exec. And I'd be saying if there's specific concerns, or we've got a specific location, then bring someone in who we know is an expert in that area. Check with our insurance. What will our insurers be expecting of us? Can they assist at all? You know, if we've got insurance with a building, what, what do they want from us? Um, and just keeping a guard, uh, an eye on those government updates so they're not always clear. And if they're not clear, reach out for some more specialist guidance. Right, very good. Uh, Julian, do you have a further point on that? Or, or, or perhaps some closing thoughts as well? No, I, I, don't, I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and as employers, we, you know, we can only do our best in, in, you know, in, in, in trying to make the workplace as safe as we can. And there is not going to be an absolute to this. No. 
We will um, we will make sure in our, our comms around this that we will add that link to the uh, the HSE site. Uh, any practical advice, um, we all need help. Uh, in, in closing, uh, I would like to to thank uh, Bevan Britton today, uh, and specifically to to Julian and, and to Rachel. Thank you. Um, thank you for all uh, attending, uh, for your time and questions today, and for those of you watching this on the Bristol Life uh, YouTube channel as well. I hope it's been uh, thought-provoking. I hope it's answered some of your questions. We can't answer everything in reality. I'm, I'm almost thinking during this, we need another session. There are so many points uh, to go through. But meantime, please look out for our next uh, Bristol Life Business Club, uh, which is this Monday, uh, Tales from the Lockdown, featuring a willfully eclectic group of speakers uh, from tech, uh, Paul Anslow of Triangle Networks, from the creative sector, Fiona Frankham of Botley Art Studios, and I think soon to be Bristol Old Vic, and from hospitality, uh, a key area, uh, Owen Morgan from Bar 44. Our next uh, Bristol Life Business Surgeries will include other sessions on financial planning. Uh, others uh, we're envisaging include commercial property, digital strategies, office design, which comes right into um, uh, this issue about COVID safe offices, recruitment and employee motivation. If your company has got professional advice in any area, such as we've had today from Bevan Britain, that can help others, please do get in touch. We all need help navigating here. Yes, this is a very tough time. But yes, this too shall pass. This has been a Media Clash production, and this has been the first Bristol Life Business Surgery. Thank you. Bristol together.